Welcome to I'll Have You Know, a podcast from Rice Business. This episode is part of our Flight Path series where guests share their career journeys, the stories of the Rice connections that got them where they are. Our guest today on I'll Have You Know is a 2022 executive MBA who soaked up every last drop of the Rice Business experience. Carrie Sprung gives 100% to every opportunity and challenge she is given, and Rice Business is no different. She shares her flight path from pursuing a biology major as an undergrad to being a vice president of marketing at a biotech firm to also being a co-founder of two medical device companies. She tells us about her time at Pfizer, a short stint in the housing market, and what led her back to her passion for medicine and innovation. Currently the Vice President for Education and the Director of the Women's Center at the Texas Heart Institute, she shares what ignited her desire to come to Rice Business for an MBA and the profound impact it has had on her life and goals for the future. Carrie, welcome to I'll Have You Know. We're so thrilled to have you here today. Oh, thank you, Maya. It's my pleasure, and it's really an honor to be invited. Well, full disclosure, before we begin, we were in the same graduating class of 2022. We were the COVID cohort, and so I just want everybody to know that this this interview is going to be a little bit different than than all the others, just because we have such a strong friendship, and it's it's like I'm talking to my sister. <laughs> <laughs> so if anybody's thinking about Rice Business, this relationship in and of itself is reason to choose Rice over any other program. Absolutely. It's one of the things I wanted to mention today is, you know, you join the program to learn business and to brush up your skills, but, you know, you definitely are going to meet some of your best friends that are going to be lifelong friends. And so get ready for that. That's the best part. So, so Kira, you're the Vice President for Education and the Director of the Women's Center at the Texas Heart Institute, which was founded by world-renowned heart surgeon Dr. Denton Cooley in 1962. You really are the poster child of, of Rice Business. You have more than two and a half decades of experience. You've been an entrepreneur. You've been the, the VP of Marketing. You've literally created the entire communications program at the Texas Heart Institute. And there's so much to get through and there's so much I want to talk to you about. But let's start at the beginning. Let's start at UT. We both went to UT. You, however, were a biology major. So so tell me what brought you to UT and what sparked the love for biology. Oh, gosh. I think my entire life, I loved math and science. And so biology was really by accident. I started out pre-nursing. There was a nursing shortage as there always is back then. And everyone said, you should go into nursing. You love medicine. You love health. And so I started out as pre-nursing. The programs were really just growing at the time. And then when it came to actually getting into the, the thick of the coursework, there really weren't spots. And so I said, well, this is a lot of science and math. I might as well go pre-med. And I liked biology. So that's what I stuck with. And that's what I ended up graduating with. And so what did you do after graduation? Oh, good question. So I I think I never intended really to go into medicine. So I realized I was was not going to become a doctor. I had a lot of fun in college and I ended up working during college and I really embraced that. And I'm a workaholic and as I am today. (laughs) So I worked a couple jobs. One of them was a clinical focus job in the orthodontic area. And I had uh, some great bosses. And I also had a fun job at the Cado. And then after that, I I was just really used to the the pace of working. And so I, I was really fortunate to be hired by Pfizer Pharmaceuticals at a time when Pfizer was company of the year in Forbes and fortune and named them one of the uh, most admired pharmaceutical companies. And it was very exciting. I worked for a division where every drug that I was representing and marketing was the first of its class. And I was the rookie of the year. I just really embraced it because all the biology that I learned was very useful. (laughs) And I was able to just walk out there and talk to doctors. I was very social. And I, I guess I learned that at UT. I was really good at networking and had a lot of fun just walking out and representing really great drugs and top in their class and talking about medicine all day long. So how many years were you at Pfizer? I was at Pfizer about six years. And I started out in the Northwest Houston area and ended up in the Texas Medical Center. So that's where my journey with the Texas Medical Center started. 
and I was in charge of all the Baylor College of Medicine accounts. So any hospital that was affiliated with Baylor College of Medicine. And I still to this day work with Baylor College of Medicine. So it was very exciting. I worked with Methodist and St. Luke's and Texas Children's, the VA and the Harris County Hospital District, which is now Harris Health. It was a lot of fun. And some of the doctors that I met there, I work for today and work with us at the Texas Heart Institute. So that was a lot of fun. And then I decided to pivot. I realized that I embraced pivoting before pivoting was a trend post-COVID. So I decided to pivot (laughs) and take my one, (laughs) one exit from medicine and go try to do some work in the real estate industry. And I really didn't know what I was doing. It was an outside sales job. And pretty quickly, a very wise mortgage broker looked at me and said, you really should go back to medicine. This is not for you. She let me work for her for a few years. And I learned a lot about mortgage banking, realized I needed to get back to medicine. So I started to look for a device job, which is a very natural progression when you're in pharmaceutical sales. You think, okay, what's next? I want to go work with devices. I ended up finding a really fun startup in Austin, Texas, getting back to Austin, which I missed. I worked there for a few years. It was in a different area of medicine. It was in orthopedics. And most of what I had sold were medications for cardiovascular disease. So I I kept thinking, I've got to get back to the heart area. But I really enjoyed it. It was a startup investor relations slash marketing job. I was the vice president for marketing. I helped them set up trade shows and hire a sales team and work with our investors and work with the different doctors that were using the products that they were distributing. And then I, I pivoted again and decided to work with a a graduate from Kellogg, newly minted MBA out of Kellogg, and a newly minted PhD out of UT, and we started our own distributorship. We basically had a service model where we went around and built out different markets across Texas, and we represented one device. We negotiated a non-exclusive license to market this point-of-care device where we worked in all the operating rooms. And so we would throw on scrubs, get in our car, throw our devices in the back of our trunk, and we would just park it in different cities for weeks on end and build out the markets and hire staff. It was fast and furious. I was pulling over on the side of the road, putting invoices in the computer and sending them (laughs) over, you know, to my partners to, you know, make sure that we were keeping all the finances straight. And I really realized I, I was crazy. You know, what we were all crazy. We were very young and what are we doing? Luckily, somebody in the group had an MBA that was helpful. But I think then is when I started to realize it might be fun to understand business from a different through a different lens. I was very strong in science. I was very strong with relationship management, but I, I was missing some some details there. And I knew it then. I actually divested my interest of that company and had some money in my pocket and decided to volunteer for a few years with a nonprofit in Austin, working on advocating for stem cell research and responsible policy. It was kind of a role where I was just helping the founder and chair of this nonprofit to educate the community about science and medicine, something I do today. I had a lot of fun, but I realized I needed to make some money. You know, my cash flow was not there and that was not going to work forever. You know, it was time. Yeah, that's important. <laughs> Got to go back to work. I needed to be gainfully employed. <laughs> so, so I started to look around for a job. The Texas Heart Institute invited me to come back and work for them. They uh, said, you know, all the things that you're doing out here for this nonprofit, we would like you to, to move back to Houston and, and work for us. And, you know, that didn't take very long to say yes. That was a, a great opportunity. Was Dr. James D. Willerson, he was the president of the Texas Heart Institute at the time, just a visionary man, really my mentor. And we are here today still at the Texas Heart Institute. So I was going to ask you about, you know, your mentors throughout your life. So Dr. Willerson was, was one of them. Tell me about that relationship that you had with him, because obviously they sought you out. So tell me about that relationship and what it was like to work with him. Oh, gosh, it was a lot of fun. The the very first day, I I remember sitting down and he put me in this tiny office and and said, um, you know, we don't really have a role for you here quite yet, but just dig in, take my lead. And there's a lot to do. We're going to recruit this phenomenal scientist and build this new department called the Department of Regenerative Medicine. And we'll take it one day at a time. He brought me into every meeting. There was this one meeting at the American Heart Association 
annual conference. And he said, just follow me around. And I said, are you sure I should be here? And I, I realized I was sitting in a room with <laughs> all of the editors of the Journal of American College of Cardiology. And it was almost like a roast type of dinner. And he just introduced me as, <laughs> you know, his new assistant and Carrie from the Texas for Stem Cell Research. And she's now working for us and she's going to help us build our regenerative medicine program. But he was very kind. He introduced me to the board members. He was patient. He gave me assignments and projects that had a lot of meat. They were challenging. About four months in, he looked at me and he said, you are going to now work with the Center for Women's Heart and Vascular Health. This is one of our research programs, and you're going to work closely with Dr. Stephanie Coulter. The individual who had started that department was going to retire, and I was mortified. I thought, oh my gosh, what am I supposed to do? And he said, you'll also be the director of constituent relations. And I literally had to go look up, like, what does the director of constituent relations do? <laughs> and one of my <laughs> roles was to run the annual appeal, which is a development function. And I did not know anything. What did it say when you look, <laughs> look that up? Oh, it's extremely broad. It's a very broad job description. <laughs> you know, it's a lot of external relations. It's building relationships. And there's special projects involved. And so I think I even spelled it wrong on LinkedIn. I mean, it was terrible. <laughs> so I actually turned to Rice. This is where the Rice journey started. I went to take courses at Rice, the Glasscock School for Nonprofit Leadership. I took a fund development course. I took an annual appeal course. I took a nonprofit finance certificate program class, and that was a practicum. And I remember getting in there, and you had to find a mentor. I went to my CFO, Fred Zeidman. He's a wonderful man, a great person to work with. And, and he said, of course, I'll be your mentor for this. And I, once I got into day one, I realized I looked at the course syllabus, and it was a lot more than I thought. I had to clear my schedule. It was the summertime, and I just canceled everything that I had planned for the weekends because this was going to take more time for me than I expected. But it was a great project, and it was a great experience. And I think then I realized I could go back to school one day. And if I really could, I didn't know if I knew how to study because it had been a lot of years at this point since I had been out of my undergrad. But you've learned how to do so many things. Yeah, I, I've learned how to do so many things along the way. And so that's when it hit me. But I waited five years till I applied to the MBA program because I was just worried I wouldn't get in. And life got in the way. I was busy. You know, I, I kept moving up in different roles at THI, taking on more projects. But every time I was promoted, I almost never lost that other hat. And so I was gathering, I was becoming a hat rack and I had all these jobs and, and I needed to learn how to work on our business and not necessarily in the business and lead teams and transfer some of this knowledge. Because all of a sudden, you know, I was starting to become one of the older, older individuals in the room, not necessarily the young intern. <laughs> That's what it hit me. I needed to connect some dots and I needed to go back and take all that experience and make sense of it. So tell me about your application process to Rice. Oh my gosh, I did not tell anybody except my father and my mother and my husband. <laughs> you know, it was sometime in the fall. I wrote some letters and the fall of 2019, right? The fall of 2019. Fall of 2019, yes, before, you know, before COVID. We none of us knew COVID was coming. And I just spent a couple weekends. I spoke with a, a few individuals who I've always considered really close friends and mentors. One of them is in Austin, and she'd gone through the executive MBA at UT. Of course, she was really trying to talk me into coming back to UT. And I said, I, I really love my husband, and I love my friends, and I love Houston, and I, I don't <laughs> think I want to travel back and forth. And thank goodness, because you really need your support system around you during this program. I think that would have been difficult. It would have been great to, to be back at my undergrad. But I really wanted to entrench in Houston because I plan on staying in Houston. So I thought, you know, Rice is really the best choice. I'd already spent so much time at Rice. We collaborate with Rice, the Texas Heart Institute. Since about 2007, 8, or 9, I had been working with the Baker Institute with Kirsten Matthews on projects related to stem cell research. And so I was comfortable there. And I just really respected the faculty members who I had heard lecture. It seemed like all the signs kept pointing to Rice. I kept meeting people who went to Rice or their kids went to Rice or I would listen to a lecture and oh wow that's a Rice graduate. So it just seemed like it was it seemed like the signs were there. 
And so I submitted it and it was around the holidays. And the stars were aligning for you. Stars were aligned. And, and then I just closed my eyes and didn't think about it. And then fast forward to January, February, it's always busy at the Texas Heart Institute at work. And I didn't think much about it. And then in March, things were starting to get very scary with COVID. I think Rice announced that they were going to shut down and we were, the whole medical center was trying to figure out what was going to happen next. And we were locking down and preparing and what are we going to do? And I remember getting a phone call from Rice saying, we're trying to get in touch with you to come to this opening Mm -hmm. session. You were accepted. (laughs) And I remember pulling over on the side of the road and I, I just thought, oh my gosh, Oh my gosh, I forgot that I even submitted this application because we've been so busy trying to figure out how to, you know, the potential global pandemic. I, you know, I said, of course I want to go. And that was it. So I remember the first time that I met you, there was a Zoom call of the women that were going to be in our cohort. And we were all in these little teeny tiny little boxes. We all introduced ourselves and, and I'll never forget, I saw you in one of those boxes and you had just had this beaming smile because that's that's who you are <laughs> and this like dynamic personality. And after that Zoom call, you called me and you said, I want to introduce myself. My name is Carrie Sprung and I'm so excited and looking forward to being in, in this program with you. And not only did you call me, but you called every single person in our cohort and introduced yourself and started building and cultivating those friendships and those relationships. And there's so many phenomenal things about you as a human being, but but to really just give 110% of yourself to this program is really unique. And it says a lot about who you are. And, and it's also why you became our class representative <laughs> of our cohort. And you also were awarded the Mike Wright Leadership Award at graduation, which is the top leadership award given to anybody at Rice University. And it just speaks volumes about the kind of person that you are. So let's back up to the program. Then we'll talk about the Leadership Award. Well, thank you. You're making me blush. It's very kind. I Let me just be very clear. I was scared. You know, I, this was a very big commitment for me. And I I wasn't sure if I would fit in. I had waited a long time to go back to school. And so I was happy to meet everyone. But I thought, you know, I have to get over this, this fear. Do I really belong here? Look at all these very capable individuals. I mean, every time I met anyone in our cohort, I was just in awe. Everyone was so accomplished, very talented, very well spoken, super successful in their career. I mean, it was impressive. And so I I thought, I don't know. I'm just going to get over my fear. I'm going to call and get to know because when it gets down to it, we're all humans. And I found that I think everybody was afraid and everybody was excited and nervous at the same time. So I guess that helped. I don't know, but it was, it was a lot of fun. And I just thought, you know, if you're going to do this, you should just go all in, put yourself out there, make some friends or not, (laughs) you know. (laughs) No, I think everybody's your friend. (laughs) I think too that we at that time, you know, we were shut down. We were locked up. I had gone back to work immediately because somebody had to go back to work and open the bills. And so a few of us were going over to the Institute, but I think we were all hungry for human connection at the time. And I think it was a time that somebody needed to break the ice and reach out. And I've just always been want to pick up the phone. I have to tell you, I I do not love Zoom. So this was a very difficult two years for me to be locked into a camera. But I really do like to just pick up the phone and call people instead of just all the back and forth emails and, and Zooming around. So I guess that's why. Tell me about your leadership journey from really the beginning to where you are right now. One of the shining parts of the Rice Program executive program is the leadership component, the leadership track. And I didn't even realize going in how committed Rice was to making sure this leadership and personal growth component was interlaced into really the entire the entire journey of the 22 months. And so I grew as a leader, not just from the material we were learning, but I think the interactions with our cohort and the interactions with our deans and our professors. For me, I, I work I work in a medical community, and most of the leaders I'm around are doctors and scientists, 
And so it was really helpful for me to step out of the healthcare setting and to be around everybody was a leader going into this program already, but working on the different areas of their leadership. And it was really nice to learn from one another and then really to have that opportunity to use the program as like a learning laboratory and to try new things that maybe I was afraid to try at the Institute and to take on responsibilities like being the class co-chair. You know, I I was working alongside of of a co-chair and and we had to learn how to be co-leaders. And that was really a fun experience for me. You know, Louise Rodriguez was fantastic. We were very different in our leadership styles. Every problem that would come up, we would workshop those together and we would talk about it and we would decide, you know, should we act? Should we not act? Should we sit on this for 24 hours? Who should we call? So it really was this side learning project going on in parallel to the coursework. And I encourage anybody who goes into the RICE program to really look around and to take these opportunities because those activities really, really were where I was actually able to take the fundamentals and take what we were learning and apply it in real time. We were assigned a coach during the program. And I actually still to this day meet with that coach. And so I found the value of coaching. I didn't really appreciate the value of coaching until this program. I've always sought out mentors and I've always been super fortunate to have amazing bosses. But mentorship is different. And I think I started to realize the value of that and the value of actually being a mentor because you you learn a lot when you're mentoring as well. Right. And you're a mentor. I am. Yeah, I started mentoring in in 2013, Breakthrough Houston students and Emerge Scholars. And I was scared going into that too. Am I going to be able to train them? Am I going to be able to help them? Am I going to add any value to their learning journey? But that was really the formal mentoring. And I'm going to continue that today. But I, for a period there, stopped finding mentors. And I realized that that is really important. I actually asked one of our professors, Kathleen Clark, who was the brand strategy professor at Rice, and if she would accept my invitation to mentor me afterwards. And so we meet quarterly and talk about brand topics. And it's been really rewarding. So and we did work together in quite a few of the classes that we had. We did. Because you could then branch off your second year, you can branch off and then kind of pick your own team. And that's kind of interesting as well, because everybody's just kind of sitting there looking at each other. And you're so comfortable with the people that you've already worked with the year before that in your second year, you're like, but I know the way that that person works. And now you want me to like, you know, step out of my comfort zone and find somebody else to work. I mean, I don't know if I want to do that. And so that's, I think that's certainly by design. And I think that a lot of us were a bit uncomfortable that second year of you go find your own team. And then, right. You know, it it was, it was, I just remember the big, the big eyes in the classroom (laughs) of trying to figure out was like, well, I mean, I know that person, but I've never worked with them before. But I mean, that's life. That's right. You know, you you have to be flexible and and you have to learn how to work with different kinds of people. And and even at the beginning, you know, they put you together with your team and you're working with people you've known for two seconds, you know, and you have to rely on them and trust them and depend on them and everything else. And then they mix it all up and they throw it all up in the air that second year, I think, very deliberately. Yeah to teach you, you know, how to come out of that little comfort zone that you've got. Yeah. Let's talk about the the volume of work. (laughs) Yes. (laughs) They say that you're drinking from a fire hose and that's true, but I think that's intentional. Yes. So that you, you do have to trust your teammate because you have to divide some things up. You have to trust that your group's going to get components of these assignments completed you know, I think that's very intentional. There's just no way you can't work together. But that's the reality of business is you're not doing this alone. Once you get to this level, you're not going to be a good leader if you can't motivate a team and work with different teams with different disciplines. I was on a team with a lot of engineers and a doctor. It was really a lot of fun because they definitely had different strengths than I had. And I was worried I wouldn't bring something to the table with these three brilliant individuals. But really all of our our skills complemented one another so it was it was really a lot of fun as we grew through the program together we were very comfortable we were very efficient and we knew one another how one another could contribute but we also flipped our roles we tried not to let one person just lean on their core strength all the time 
Yeah, I mean, that's what you want to do. I mean, that's human nature. It's like, I know how to do communications. How about if I do this? And then you do the spreadsheets because I'm not touching those with the 10-foot pole. <laughs> yeah, but this is where you're supposed to try new things. Right, and fail. Yes. I mean, not necessarily in the class, but just to, you know, to, to recognize that, oh gosh, I really don't know how this program works. And then you can lean on your teammate or, or somebody in your cohort or like, hey, I mean, I can't tell you how many times I'm like, hey, can you meet me for coffee and explain Excel to me? Because I still don't understand it. They've done a great job cultivating the curriculum where everybody's almost on an even playing field, even though there's different strengths here and there. That goes away as soon as you walk in there and we're all challenged but in the best way. It was exhilarating, exhausting, all the above. But I remember feeling like, oh, wow, I'm going to miss this. I felt like, wow, I want to graduate because this is exhausting, but I know I'm going to miss it the day we graduate. And I do. you know. And I realized I should just enjoy every single moment because this is something that no one can take away from us. And it's for us. you know. So these 16-hour weekends it wasn't, oh, a chore. I have to go to class. I mean, it was a privilege to go to class and just sit there for 16 hours and realize that you're doing something that's so helpful for you, your family, your company, your community. And it was really the best 22 months. It was just the world priceless. It's hard to describe to somebody until they do it. And once you're through it, it's just a sense of accomplishment. And it seems like everything after graduation is easier. And you miss it. I miss it. But don't you feel like, like I knew going in, I, I didn't have the tools I needed to make these hard decisions that were coming my way at work. And I was very worried, big decisions and big topics. But now, I mean, nothing phases me. And I feel like I'm able to draw on all these lessons. And I can't really pinpoint one lesson. It's more the body of the material. And they've really chosen great cases. And so I, I find that there's not a day that doesn't go by where I have applied something that I learned to my entire life, to how I volunteer, how I'm working with my family, how I'm managing my personal life, how my husband and I interact, how my friends and I interact, and decisions I make moment to moment. I'm definitely able to make those with much more confidence. So I can't say enough good things. <laughs> Yeah, it permeates. It does. It permeates your entire being. That's a big, bold statement, but it's the truth. It really does. And and it changes you. It changes you. It does. And I also just want to mention that the Mike Wright Leadership Award, that's given, we vote, the class votes on who should be awarded this honor. And we all voted for, well, I'm pretty sure most of us voted for you. Oh, (laughs) well, thank you. So tell me what that felt like to receive that from your cohort. It was an incredible honor. It was probably the highest honor to be voted by your peers, especially considering I was wondering if I would even fit into this program and if I had anything to contribute. But I really wanted to get into the program, meet new people outside of medicine, inside of medicine, and just find out if I had the capability to work across industries and connect with people that were not in healthcare and even keep up with some of these brilliant minds. And so I I think I was honored, humbled, shocked. What am I going to say on this podium that anybody in this audience doesn't already know? And so (laughs) my approach was, we did this together, honestly, and this was, we should all be very proud And we just made it through a global pandemic and earned a degree. And we are extremely close because of it. So all challenges moving forward should be surmountable. What's next for you? What are you planning on doing in the next few years going forward? God, it's a great question. You know, you get out of the program and you think you're going to have so much time, but you very quickly fill it. (laughs) Yeah, there's no time. (laughs) So I... I was wanting to make sure that I didn't just graduate and go back to my old ways. And so I've been very mindful of that. I didn't expect to do this, but I I started to engage with a startup nonprofit. One of the things I wanted to do was work with startups because I have so much, I have 360 degree view of innovation in medicine. And I thought, well, a natural thing will be for me to advise startups and be able to share what I know, having started startups myself or worked in academic medicine and at a research institute. 
But I found myself drawn to the community. I've always loved engaging the community. Part of my role as the director of the Center for Women's Heart and Vascular Health is to go out into the community and educate everyone about their risk for heart disease. And there was a startup called Fit Houston, and I agreed to be an executive advisor. And we've had a lot of fun. And the very first thing that the founder asked me was, I need to build a board and I need to learn about how we should build this. And do you have anybody who might be interested in health? And so I started to introduce her to people like you and and members of my cohort who I knew embraced health in general. And she was looking for a treasurer. And I suggested one of our cohort members, Yuande Ogunye. Yes. Who is amazing and talented and a brilliant accountant. (laughs) Brilliant accountant and had been a controller at one of her companies and had worked with a startup. And so that was her first appointment to her board. And I recently joined the board from the executive advisory committee. But we we engaged Rice. We were invited to write an article in the Kinder Institute for Urban Research, Urban Edge blog on physical activity is the magic bullet for health. And we've actually received some funding from the Rice University Center for Civic Leadership. And we're going to be talking with a group of students in the Rice App Club. I think I'm saying that right. There's a a club at Rice and they were looking for nonprofits to work with and build an app for them. So that's our next project. So that's been a lot of fun and super rewarding. I've been able to draw on lessons from strategy, lessons from digital marketing, brand strategy, a little bit of finance. We've written some grants. We're applying for a grant at the Impact 100. That's been rewarding. So I didn't expect that. You know, there's a couple startups, some intellectual property that I, I think is very interesting that once this starts to be commercialized. I'd like to be a part of those companies. So I think that's what's next. Really, I'm, I'm applying as much as I can at the Texas Heart Institute where I work now. There's a lot of operations challenges that we are overcoming. You know, in healthcare operations is almost the Achilles heel. I brought in a healthcare operations lab project from Rice last spring. It was a course that I took And I learned so much. I got to work with MD Anderson, which was really exciting on a practicum type project, capstone type project. And so after graduation, I approached Ian Wedgwood, who's the professor for this course, and said, I would love to bring in some students for projects. So I anticipate we'll do that again in the spring. It was really rewarding and a lot of fun. And it was was really nice to be reconnected back to a couple of the executive MBAs who were just one year below us and keep in touch with them. So I think that's what's next for the foreseeable few months. I mean, that's it? I'm just kidding. Well, (laughs) that's it? (laughs) That's a long time. Well, I should turn this interview back on you. One thing we did during this program that we didn't talk about was you and I immediately partnered, created our own series. We did. And how you were really helpful for me because I was straddling and juggling work and MBA And I needed to still, during a pandemic, continue to elevate the profile of my institution. And so we decided to launch our own series called The Heartbeat. And I remember bringing you into the Institute, (laughs) pulling you around and just throwing a camera on you and throwing you into the studio. And I remember saying, no, 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 I don't do that anymore. No, I'm not. I can't do that anymore. And you're like, "Ah, yeah, I can. Here's a microphone, Maya. (laughs) You were amazing. And so I had you. I think we had we did 15 episodes. It was it was a highlight. What was that like the first time I interviewed you? I mean, it was. Yes, you you did. You interviewed me. And now it's like I'm interviewing you which is full circle. But but yeah, it was one of those things that I had never even contemplated doing. And I mean, you definitely you pushed me into what was a comfort zone a long time ago that I had sort of let go of. I can't tell you how grateful I am for you for doing that for me. And I think that's one of the things about this program is that we lift each other up. There's so many instances, not just between you and I, but between so many different people from so many different cohorts in the history of the Rice Business Program, we're there for each other in the great times and in the hard times. And, you know, if somebody's looking for a new position, you know, we've got this WhatsApp group where everybody can say, hey, I'm looking for this or I'm, I need to fill this or does anybody, I'm, I've got this kid, my kid needs an internship and everything else. And it's just that community that really binds for life. And that is something that is so incredibly special and meaningful and really 
priceless and worth every penny of admission. A hundred percent. A hundred percent. Any final thoughts that you'd like to share with our listeners? Oh, gosh. I think it's really important to thank your family and your friends and your company for the grace <laughs> that they give you during this program. So I, you know, I don't think I thank everybody enough and the team that I manage at the office. And, you know, they also helped me. They gave me the space to be able to, to do this and to miss a few deadlines. And I think it's really important to understand how much support you need going into this program, but to thank those that helped you and to my entire cohort and to you. I mean, this experience wouldn't be what it was without the people. And so it really is all about the people and the culture. And I think we built our own in a couple of years and we loved it. We did. We did. And I am so grateful for your time. And I can't wait to see what you do next. And who knows, maybe you'll be the host of I'll Have You Know one day. <laughs> that would be great. You never know. You never know. You never know. Thanks, Maya. This has been an honor. Thank you so much for a fun interview. Thanks for listening. This has been I'll Have You Know, a production of Rice Business. You can find more information about our guests, hosts, and announcements on our website, business.rice.edu. Please subscribe and leave a rating wherever you find your favorite podcasts. We'd love to hear what you think. The hosts of I'll Have You Know are myself, Maya Pomeroy, and Scott Gale.